the subject matter of this cassette can, to begin with, only have meaning against our existing ideas. These would have been formed from our upbringing, our teachers, our reading and thinking, and they are likely to be along conventional or traditional lines. According to commonly held views, man is an animal, a member of the animal kingdom, but he has developed intelligence to a remarkable degree above all other animals. This he has done in the long course of his evolution from an ape stock. The evolutionary stages to support this view are by no means complete and many question it. It is however still maintained that there may be the primitive humanoid remains yet to be found which will establish man's descent from the primates. Esoteric science takes a different view of man's origins and this is given on a later cassette. Incidentally we must stress to avoid any doubts or confusion that in all we have to say about man we include equally in all respects woman unless the sex difference is significant. The matter of human origins has only been mentioned here because of the prevailing materialistic view of his nature wherein he, he is taken to be a complex biological organism with certain physiological characteristics and capabilities entirely dependent on and inseparable from his component physical organs and limbs for their expressions. In other words, the body came first and faculty followed as the body developed the special means for its function. The body became both more and more able to receive impressions of and from its environment and to act increasingly effectively in response to them. Aptitude as skill in action and improved sensitivity or response grew in the long run from experience and expediency. Another conventional view of man's makeup held by those who have been brought up in Christian religious teaching is that man has a soul and some would hold that he has a spirit as well. In Eastern religions he is commonly regarded as having or being all three. This idea of there being such a thing as soul or spirit complicates the purely physiological view that function is entirely dependent upon and stems from a form or an organ. It says in effect that there is a dynamic or life apart from organ or form but which needs organ or form through which to function to express itself. From the esoteric point of view this latter extension to the purely material concept is a fundamental necessity. Without it we are lacking an indispensable factor in explaining an infinity of phenomena. To this latter view there is an important corollary. If man is a multi-faculty, multi-functional being apart from the expression of these activities in and through his physical body, there must be that in the soul or spirit which gives rise to faculty. In other words, soul and spirit, and we will define these terms as we go along, must be multi-aspected. Esoteric science says that they are and it gives us a constitution of man 
in terms of his faculties on the one hand and in terms of his personal characteristics, his character qualities on the other. The science regards man as having several principles which are, so to speak, the means of expression for his faculties. They include his physical body, but they also extend into the inner or invisible realms of being where, however, even though they are non-physical, they are regarded as substantial. Substantial here is used in a special sense. Esoteric science says that whereas everything stems from a common source, that source has two aspects. It is polar. The manifest cosmos and everything in it, whether physical and objective, as in our ordinary world, or non-physical and subjective, as in the case of our dreaming, thinking and feeling, is also polar. Polarity means having two poles, like the north and south poles of a magnet. In electricity, there is positive and negative. In biology, there is male and female. These and similar pairs of opposites apply generally, as in darkness and light, hot and cold, activity and rest, good and evil, to and fro, rise and fall, and so on. When applied to the constitution of matter, in a general sense, or anything in particular, the polarity can be seen in terms of energy and substance, life and form, faculty and its means of expression. Extending this idea into the inner realms of existence, which esoteric science postulates, we have the fundamental dichotomy of spirit and matter. Spirit is the universal dynamic principle or male aspect, and matter, the universal substance, the containing formative passive principle, the female aspects of the primordial one substance. As used here, this is a metaphysical concept. Substance is that which underlies matter, and matter in this sense is regarded as existing at all levels of being. In the inner worlds it is a non-physical condition. This apparent diversion into the spirit and substance duality is relevant because the teaching says that man is essentially a spirit, and that this spirit operates at various inner levels through various inner substantial principles or vehicles of perception and action, down to and including his physical vehicle or body. These inner principles are also vehicles of consciousness. But man has not yet developed the ability to be aware in the higher ones. The mode of action of spirit at the various levels, corresponding to man's perceptive and active faculties, depends upon the characteristics of the principle and its development through which spirit operates at any particular level. This is the room rule simply stated. There are complications. These arise from the complex nature of the principles. Another simple statement about man's constitution, but one which has tremendous ramifications, 
is that man is a natural being. This may seem too obvious to need stating, but if true, it relates man directly to nature. In other words, man derives his being totally from nature. But in esoteric science, his being is not only physical, it is non-physical in its inner aspects as well. In this, he also reflects nature. But again, however we regard her, nature is also part of cosmos. She is cosmic in her nature. This means, therefore, that man is also cosmic in his nature. Now, what the implications of this are, we will see as we go on. But we now see man in relation not only to our immediate natural world, but to cosmos as a whole. He is not an isolated entity. He is in and of the whole. He's one with it with the total unity. Now this is an example of how the key ideas enunciated in the first cassette apply generally. Now bearing in mind man's essential identity with nature and cosmos, we are now in a position to examine his esoteric constitution in terms of his faculties. But first, we must look at some further generalities. The spirit, functioning in entities, does so, as we have seen, in two modes. Inflowing, receptive or responsive, and outflowing, energetic or active. The inflow, as far as any creature is concerned, is by way of its senses, and the outflow by way of means of action, limbs or voice. Another factor that must now enter our consideration is that of consciousness. To receive an impression from outside via our senses, the impression must register in consciousness. Consciousness, or the ability to be aware, is assumed for any unit of life. It might be that of the cells of a body and not necessarily that of the unit being composed of them. For example, our internal organs are continually about their business, performing their respective functions, responding to chemical and nervous signals, but normally we know little or nothing of what they are doing. Then there is the faculty of will, intent or volition, which generates or impels us to action. And necessarily there is that which in any active creature's makeup enables a subjective impulse to action to be translated into bodily motion. There must be a mechanism to translate the immaterial, non-physical intention into physical action. For example, to move limbs. So, reverting to man and his faculties, what have we? First, we have that man is a living entity a unit of life with a unit consciousness. As he partakes of the universal life, there must be some elements of his being deriving from and corresponding to the universal spirit and from the one substance, which become ultimately life and form. The dual aspects in every, every living creature, including man. Because of these higher life aspects in his makeup, 
the essence of man's being is said to be spirit itself operating through a substantial vehicle at its level to give it effective expression. The teaching has it that this spirit substance duality is the basic cosmic one and therefore that it is present in the makeup of any manifest thing. In the literature it is known as monad, the fundamental essence of universal manifestation and it is not properly a principle of individual man. It is however regarded as being a component of his nature as his two highest principles spirit and its vehicle when taken together. These become principles of individual man only as they are focused in or through a third principle, that of mind. This is individual and in it the consciousness of I am I arises. It is by reason of this consciousness bestowing conscious identity that the two higher purely spiritual and cosmic principles can be regarded as principles of individual man. In fact, in the teaching, the three taken together as a trinity are regarded as the man's spiritual self, his true individual individuality or ego, in this sense spelt with a capital E. They are referred to as the upper triad, the essential spiritual man, sometimes called his spiritual soul. And very importantly, by reason of their nature, these elements of man's being are virtually immortal. Now, let us regard man from our more normal point of view, from which we see him as a person with a physical body with certain characteristics. He will have mannerisms of speech, certain skills and knowledge, and all sorts of personal idiosyncrasies. The proper study of his body is anatomy, physiology, and neurology. All of these subjects have their esoteric aspects and man's physical organs have their correspondences with his inner faculties. We, however, will see that man's physical body as the is the means of expressing these inner faculties in the outside world. We will also see it as a living organism composed of living elements, its organs, its bony framework, its glands, blood, and so on. Every part of it is living. It is a complex whole, and every part of it is a vehicle, a means of expression for an indwelling life. The body as a whole is capable of action in its particular way, and so is each of its parts each organ. When regarded as a colony of cells, we can see it as a hierarchy of lives, of specialized lives, each subserving the whole. There is that, however, which coordinates the activities of all these parts. There is, so to speak, a functional director that never rests during the whole life of the body. At death, when the coordinator no longer operates as such, the body's organic functions become chaotic and putrefaction starts. The presence or absence of the coordination determines the difference between a live and a dead body. Be it noted that the coordinator, while affecting the physical body, is itself non-physical in the same way that that which determines what the brain shall think or remember is non-physical and distinct from the brain. As for thinking, 
so with feeling. It can be held justifiably that our desires and aversions, our loving and our hating, are in themselves non-physical, although they may all affect our bodies. We blush, we blanche, we become tense, we feel sick, we tremble. But it's not these that are emotion, nor even what give rise to it. The emotion gives rise to them. They are mere reactions. But, be it noted, they all register in consciousness. We are aware of our feelings, and what is more, as in the case of thinking, we can learn to control them. We will see how significant this is when we come to discuss spiritual training and meditation. We can now perhaps see some clearly defined elements in man's makeup. We see that the very essence of his being is, or at least is postulated at this stage of our inquiry, as being universal spirit operating through its own highly spiritual but nonetheless substantial vehicle. And both of these are focused into a mind principle, man's inmost seat of consciousness and of his sense of individuality. Here we have our higher trinity or triad, that is, spirit, its vehicle and mind, three principles constituting according to the teaching, a persisting immortal entity. In this idea of man having an immortal spiritual individuality, we have one which justifies belief in an afterlife, in some state which, as we shall see, is dependent on how the man has lived while on earth. Then we saw man with feelings, stemming from a non-physical area of his being, constituting another principle. And lastly, a triad consisting of life or vitality, and a coordinator, a directive agent, and lastly his physical body. And so man in this classification is sevenfold, with three spiritual or individual aspects and four lower ones that may be regarded when taken together as the mortal personality. The emotional principle is closely associated with the personal mind, and these two taken together are often regarded as a unit a mento-emotional complex. This, together with the vital principle and its vehicle, comprise the mortal soul of man. Now there's one funda fundamental com complication to this simple structure. The mind principle has to be regarded as dual. This is because the man himself is dual. Essentially, he is an individuality, a spiritual being, but he acts in the world as a personality. In both aspects, he is obviously a thinker. This necessitates some elements of mind be, being included in the personal man's makeup, and some in the higher, the individual man. This may be difficult at first to see or accept, but it becomes significant as we progress in our studies, and it should be particularly noted and remembered. Another complication which should also be noted now, but which will be discussed on the second side of this cassette, is that each principle is said to be sevenfold, composed of seven sub-principles, and each sub-principle reflects the nature of the corresponding main principle. For example, number four sub-principle would reflect the characteristics or nature of 
number four main principle that of desire and feeling it must never be forgotten that man in spite of his sevenfold constitution is a whole he is a unique being his principles do not constitute se separate beings even though they give expression through his physical body when he's alive to the several aspects of his character his faculties and so on without much thought we can soon begin to see how a clearly defined structure to man's total being can be the basis for an understanding of much that intimately affects him but which would otherwise be obscure for example what happens to him after death what the rationale of reincarnation may be and how psychic experiences and psychological states and problems may be explained the esoteric science has been called the explanatory science because it gives the data in the light of which so many things can be explained in the fields of holistic healing personal transformation through relaxation and meditation psychotechnologies generally the body mind connection and so on very much has been discovered recently but empirically many systems for restoring the body to health are now proving effective the effects of stress and the craving for stimulants and other drugs are being relieved the current explanations of these effects are in both the scientific and lay worlds in terms of it is as if for example there were an inner entity at work it is it is conceded that the mind can influence bodily functions and that there is a natural tendency to health if proper mental and emotional conditions can be created esoteric science postulates those very factors in the complex makeup of man and explains their nature and function and their interdependence and interaction it is a complicated story briefly however in the light of what has already been said and what will be elaborated on the second side of this cassette the factor most overlooked is the truly spiritual essence of man's being this is the source of innate wisdom real understanding and power it has these qualities beyond our imagining it is inviolable it is unaffected by the hard experiences of ordinary life it cannot be affected by disease of any kind it is the source of pure reason of compassion conscious kinship with others and all existence it is something of this which percolates into normal consciousness as we learn to give it access to our attention it is this this which can bring peace to our lower minds normally so concerned with our personal even selfish affairs as to be impervious to its promptings the various forms of meditation help to alleviate this condition when the lower mind is at rest except when we are consciously using it for its legitimate purposes and have it under control its natural powers restore it to normal or normality and health it then can affect our emotional vehicle and bring that to health the action is however not all one way our emotions can affect our personal minds to the point where we become irrational reason cannot prevail the mind can become a turmoil and various ill effects then arise 
we can become obsessed with fears, feelings of inadequacy, of not being wanted. We are unable to communicate freely. We bottle up our affections for fear of hurt. We harbor a tutti quanti of undesirable mental and emotional demons. It is these which wreak havoc with our health. But more than that, they create a barrier of distraction by our unceasing internal obsessions with work or worry or even by our subconscious compulsions. They completely isolate us from our real inner selves. The great tragedy is that most of us do not know this is happening and most of us cannot be brought even to concede that it could be. Why are we so ignorant of our own inner nature? The short answer is you need on evolution nature, and most of us are not good enough to respond to the promptings of our higher selves. It is in this that techniques of relaxation and meditation exercise can help. We quieten our inner chatter, at least for a time. Another factor in our optimal relationship, where esoteric science helps us to understand what is happening, is one of the functions of the principle next to the body in our scale of being. This principle provides the link between our inner subjective faculties and our physical body. It is also the inner model or counterpart of our body, such that a change in it will reflect into our body. It is affected both from within by our emotional and mental states and health, hence their effect on our health. For good health, we need our minds and emotions to be fulfilling harmoniously their proper healthy functions and otherwise to learn to control them. This brings about the state that is commonly being, commonly being referred to as transformation, a new kind of self-awareness in which our sense of values changes dramatically. All the above is only an outline of the way our inner activities react upon our bodies. Further impl implications of the information we now have will become obvious as our studies proceed. Here we must start defining some technical terms and it would be advisable for the first time student to make notes, although it's surprising how soon one becomes familiar with these new words drawn mostly from the ancient religious language of Sanskrit. As most people know, karma, K-A-R-M-A, commonly pronounced karma is in one of its aspects the law of cause and effect whereby man finds himself in those circumstances in life and in relationship to others that at some time not necessarily in this life he has made for himself it is the law of universal justice in action karma k-a-m-a as distinct from karma, is desire, that which motivates us to action. It can mean craving, and hence passion. Linga Sharira, L-I-N-G-A hyphen S-A-R-I-R-A, a hyphenated compound word signifying the pattern body. And it's the vehicle for vitality, the life force. It is the causal form in the inner worlds. It is the model upon which the physical body is built. The English equivalent of the term is commonly the astral body. Prana, P-R-A-N-A, -A, is the life force or vital principle in man, derived from the cosmic life principle, Jiva, J-I-V-A. 
Spirit is the universal dynamic and has many names, but commonly it is known as Atma, A-T-M-A, or Atman, the highest plane of cosmos and the highest principle in man, the seventh. Its vehicle, that which gives it expression in a manifest universe, is Buddhi, B-U-D-D-H-I. This is important. Now, Buddhi, as a combination, is Mad, M-O-N-A-D. Manas is mind and all that means. It is regarded as being dual with a higher spiritual and a lower personal aspect. Devachan, D-E-V-A-C-H-A-N, is a blissful state enjoyed by the spiritual or egoic man after death. Rupa, R-U-P-A, simply means form or body and is commonly used in connection with karma, K-A-M-A, as karma rupa, the desire body. The attitude is that indescribable, unknowable physical, which is postulated as pre-existing all existence. All the above terms are frequently used so that they sh- so they should be memorized uh, and as we have occasion to use others they will be explained lastly because it's such a important of this teaching of his essential spiritual nature to his religious propensities Man is himself a divine being. But we will enlarge on this later. This is the nub of the whole teaching. The seven principles of man and their relationship to the cosmic planes will be on the next side of this cassette. On the first side of this cassette, we introduced the idea of man's complex makeup as given to us in esoteric science against a background of more conventional views. We mentioned his direct relationship as a natural being to nature and thence to cosmos. We must now introduce a key idea that man in his total constitution reflects totally that of cosmos. The several elements or principles of his being, mostly, as we have seen, in the inner and to us normally invisible realms, correspond directly to what are commonly referred to as the planes of cosmos. As it relates to cosmos, this is not a simple idea because, as we shall see, a so-called plane of cosmos encompasses many constituents, all of which reflect into the principles of man. Even so far as these principles are concerned, there are a number of classifications and groupings, but by far the most used is that based on man's faculties and life aspects that we outlined in the first side of this cassette and which we will now elaborate. We must first mention some of the constituents which in the aggregate comprise the cosmic planes. In the truly cosmic sense these planes soar into realms of being with which we as yet cannot possibly have any concern. They are too far beyond us at our present evolutionary stage. We can really only concern ourselves with the lowest cosmic plane, which, as in the case of man's principles, consists of seven subplanes, each reflecting in character a main plane. 
Here we must remember our key idea that cosmos is a living whole, a total entity comprising a series of hierarchies of living beings. The cosmos is in fact a hierarchy with at its apex beings of such might, majesty and power as to be beyond our conception and at its lower levels irresponsible rudimentary elementals, mere forces in nature. Another idea to which we have to accustom ourselves is that as cosmos is a living whole everything in it is living. We have also the idea of duality the duality of life and form or force and that through which it acts. Here we must notice that the container or transmitter of force and the matter, the form, the body in and through which the life aspect functions is itself living. In its constituents it is living beings even if these constituents are mere atoms. The word atom in esoteric science applies not only to physical chemical atoms but to life atoms units of life constituting the smallest particles both in this world and the inner ones. In both senses atoms are themselves living entities and they are entities with particular characteristics. At the physical level they are the essences of our chemical elements. Here we come across the idea in esoteric science of the fundamental elements which we introduced in cassette one. These are the elements that the old philosophers named earth, water, air and fire. Esotericism says there are three more to complete the septonate which is a feature of all aspects of the structure and function of cosmos. The reason for the introduction of what might seem unnecessary complication at this stage is that all that comprises cosmos is grouped into scales of qualities and powers and these groups are related directly by correspondence. The cosmic planes, the principles of man, his senses, the elements and many other groups correspond to each other. Beings constitute the planes and impart to them their characteristics. Everything in cosmos is at and represents an evolutionary stage. These stages are exemplified in our earth in the kingdoms of nature. Instead, however, of the three we normally recognize, mineral, vegetable and animal, with humanity sometimes regarded as a fourth, esoteric science says there are ten. It says there are three sub-material realms which it calls the elemental kingdoms. Then there are the four just mentioned which are followed by three post or superhuman ones. The three elemental and the three superhuman kingdoms extend considerably the evolutionary field beyond the normally accepted range. This extension is because esoteric science admits the inner or invisible realms into its evolutionary scheme. We will see later how important this extension is when we come to consider the origins and evolutionary development of a planetary globe like our Earth and even of man himself. Concerning more specifically man's sevenfold constitution there is a table in the key to theosophy chapter 6 which sets out and describes 
his component principles. It starts with the physical body as number one and proceeds to spirit as number seven. It divides the principles into two groups. The lower four it refers to as the lower quaternary and the higher three as the upper imperishable triad. The following is an extract from the book but some paraphrasing has been made to adapt the written to the spoken word. The physical body, as number one principle it says, is the vehicle of all other principles during life. The second principle is the life or vital principle, prana, which it says is necessary only to principles one, three and four and the functions of lower mind, which embrace all those limited to the physical brain. Commonly, when related to the plane of being, this vitality principle is put third in the classification. The third principle is the astral body, the double, the non-physical counterpart of the physical body or the phantom body. It is this that we have referred to rather loosely as the coordinator. In terms of planes, this is commonly the second, not the third, as given here. The fourth principle, the seat of animal desires and passions, the karma rupa, is the center of the animal man where lies the line of demarcation which separates the mortal man from the immortal entity. The fifth principle, manas, is that of mind, intelligence, the higher human mind, whose light or radiation links the monad for the lifetime to the mortal man. The future state and the karmic destiny of man depend on whether Manas gravitates more towards Karma Rupa, the seat of animal passions, or upward to Buddhi, the spiritual ego. In the latter case, the higher consciousness of the individual spiritual aspirations of mind assimilating Buddhi are absorbed by it and form the ego, which goes into Devachanic bliss. The sixth principle, buddhi, the spiritual soul, is, as we have said, the vehicle of pure universal spirit. The seventh principle, atma, spirit, is one with the absolute as its radiation. There are two more informative passages in the key amplifying what we have just been told and more positively defining some terms which are often used loosely. In one such passage, chapter 8, is Atma, the higher self, is neither your spirit nor mine, but like sunlight shines on all. It is the universally diffused divine principle it is inseparable from its one and absolute super-spirit, as the sunbeam is inseparable from sunlight. Secondly, we have buddhi, the spiritual soul, its only vehicle. Neither atma nor buddhi separately, nor the two collectively, are of any more use to the body of man than sunlight and its beams are a mass of granite buried in the earth. Unless the divine duad is assimilated by and reflected in some consciousness. Neither Atma nor Buddhi are ever reached by Karma because the former is the highest aspect of Karma, the working agent of itself in one aspect and the latter that buddhi is unconscious on this plane. 
this consciousness or mind is thirdly manas the derivation or product in a reflected form of ahamkara a-h-a-m-k-a-r-a -A -A, the conception of I or egoship it is therefore when inseparably united to the first two called the spiritual ego and taijasa t-a-i-j-a-s-a -A -A, the radiant this is the real individuality or the divine man it is this ego which having originally incarnated in the senseless human form animated by but unconscious of the presence in itself of the dual monad since it had no consciousness made of that human-like form a real man it is this ego which is held responsible for all the sins committed through and in every new body or personality the evanescent masks which hide the true individuality through the long series of rebirths the expression senseless human form which is unconscious of itself will be uh, explained later when we deal with man's origins a further amplification of these definitions in the key is as follows this is from chapter 9 towards the end the higher self is atma the inseparable ray of the universal and one self it is the god above more than within us and happy the man who succeeds in saturating his inner ego with it the spiritual divine ego is the spiritual soul or buddhi in close union with manas the mind principle without which the former is no ego at all but only the atomic vehicle the inner or higher ego is manas the fifth principle so called independently of buddhi the mind principle is only the spiritual ego when merged into one with buddhi no materialist being supposed to have in him such an ego however great his intellectual capacities it is the permanent individuality or reincarnating ego the lower or personal ego usually sp spelt with a small e in this sense is the physical man in conjunction with his lower self that is animal instincts passions desires etc it is called the false personality and consists of the lower manas combined with karma rupa and operating through the physical body and its phantom or double stressing the point made before it is said that manas has its source in universal mind or mahat m-a-h-a-t and that it is manas therefore which is the real incarnating and permanent spiritual ego the individuality and our various numberless personalities only its external masks we have said that the principles of man correspond directly to those of cosmos it is fairly easy to see that man's physical body corresponds to the physical material objective world of which we are aware through our senses we must not overlook however how far the material plane extends embracing as it does the microscopic at one end of the scale and the macroscopic at the other we need assistance by way of microscopes uh, on the one hand and telescopes on the other to enhance the power of our normal senses 
to know of these extensions to physical existence, normally beyond our ken. One of the ways of comprehending esoteric science is by the law of analogy. By this method, the similarities between things in the inner or higher realms and those in the physical world, regardless of their magnitude, can be realized. In this way, we come to realize the truth of the old hermetic philosopher's axiom that as is the inner, so is the outer. As is the great, so is the small. As it is above, so it is below. There is but one life and law, and he that worketh it is one. Nothing is inner, nothing is outer, nothing is great, nothing is small, nothing is high, nothing is low in the divine economy. This is a marvelous aid to acquiring insight into the significance of many aspects of the esoteric teaching. Applying this saying to the relationship between man and cosmos, we see that what we can know of ourselves is an entry into much greater knowledge. We are, in our bodies, a hierarchy of lives, so is cosmos. We have inner principles, so does cosmos. We have our human abilities or faculties. These reflect the same things on the grand scale in cosmos. We derive our life at all levels of being from the one source, so does cosmos. We have personal characteristics such as, for example, those that used to be attributed to the elements, humors as they were called, the choleric, sanguine, bilious and melancholy, representing tendencies to anger, confidence, irritability and sadness. And then we have the characteristics attributed to and symbolized in the astrological planets. As we have said, there are many scales of correspondences in the cosmic scheme, all of them reflecting into man. There are the elements and states of matter, common to man and cosmos, and there are the modes of consciousness and modes of awareness through our senses. Man is subject to universal law, his body rhythms reflect those of cosmos. The teaching tells us that the beings who have achieved the post-human states and have therefore developed faculties and the vehicles for their, their expression beyond the normal human stage can and do endow nascent humanity with them. And this is especially the case with mind, as we shall see later on. It is therefore not only man's physical body which demonstrates an hierarchical organization or structure, but man's inner vehicles too, in that they derive from and reflect the non-physical hierarchies. Now such a statement can be difficult to accept unless we realize the livingness of everything, both inner and outer. This livingness is the basis of much more than the nature of the components of the cosmic structure. Everything in its order exhibits a degree of responsive awareness to its environment. This consciousness is of a more or less degree according to the nature and development of its possessor. It is by reason of the innate consciousness of the beings comprising cosmos from the lowest to the highest that cosmos is ordered. We might say that everything in cosmos knows its part in the total economy and how to play it. 
This is the case throughout the whole piece, with man in a special position at the apex of the ladder of development in the physical world. He is not only conscious of his environment and what is of concern to him in it, as are the other creatures, but he is aware of himself in his surroundings. This is self-consciousness, and this ability to be aware of himself, this feeling of I am I, enables him not only to be self-aware with respect to external things and conditions, but to what goes on inside him by way of thoughts and feelings. The review of the constitution of man would not be complete without reference to that which makes him an entity, a being during his extended egoic lifetime distinct from every other being. This is sometimes referred to as the auric envelope or auric egg, whereof the shell constitutes the boundary of his individual being. As is the greater, so is the smaller. As a man has such a limiting surface or boundary, so does everything else. In terms of the macrocosm, a solar system for example, it is said to have such a ring pass knot beyond which nothing can go and yet remain part of it. In the physical world such a limit would be represented by a man's skin, but the boundary of being extends also into the inner worlds. In the case of man, the shell of his auric egg is a film of akashic substance. When thinking in terms of the auric egg, a man is regarded as being composed of only his inner vehicles, and Atma, as a universal spirit, is not regarded as one of these. The Akashic envelope is sometimes counted as a principle containing Buddhi, higher and lower manners, regarded in this case as two principles, Karma, Prana, and the Linga Sharira, or astral body. This constitutes another classification of man's principles, but it, is in, but it in no way invalidates the more usual one given on the first side and as amplified earlier on this side of this cassette. Another way of regarding man's makeup is in terms of what is permanent or enduring through many, many personal lifetimes and what is temporary relating to the ephemeral personality. The first, the immortal ones only, are regarded as principles. The others, the mortal transitory ones, are regarded as aspects. The basic or in eternal principles are one, Atma or Jiva, the one life, which permeates the monadic or egoic trio, one in three and three in one. Two, auric envelope, described as of the universally diffused primordial and pure akasha, the first film on the boundless and shoreless expanse of jiva, the immutable root of all. Three, Buddhi, a ray of the universal spiritual soul, sometimes referred to as Alaya, A-L-A-Y-A. -A. Four, Manas, the higher ego, for it proceeds from Mahat, M-A-H-A-T, the first product or emanation of Pradhana. Pradhana is equivalent to Akasha, and is said to contain all the gunas, the attributes, that is, those of inertia, activity, and balance, or harmony. Mahat, 
as we have said, is cosmic intelligence and referred to as the great principle. The three aspects in this classification are products of the principles and are one, prana, the breath of life, which at the death of a person or any living being re-becomes jiva, two, linga sharira, the astral form, the transitory emanation of the auric egg. <coughs> As a form, it proceeds, precedes the formation of the living body and after death clings to it, dissipating only with the disappearance of its last atom, the skeleton accepted. Three, lower manus, the animal soul sometimes so called, the reflection or shadow of the buddhi manas, having the potentialities of both but conquered generally by its association with karma elements. That quotation is from the Secret Doctrine, third volume, page 493. There are two explanatory notes about prana and mahat relating to their use in this classification of principles and aspects. Prana, on earth at any rate, is thus but a mode of life, a constant cyclic motion from within outwardly and back again, an out-breathing and an in-breathing of the one life or jiva the synonym of the absolute unknowable deity. Prana is not absolute life or jiva, but its aspect in a world of delusion. Prana is said to be one stage finer than the gross matter of the earth. In connection with Mahat, we are reminded that our reincarnating egos are called Manasa Putras, sons of Manas or Mahat, intelligence or wisdom. Regarding our principles and the planes of cosmos, we are told that neither the cosmic planes of substance nor even the human principles, with the exception of the lowest material plane or world and the physical body, which, as has been said, are no principles, can be located or thought of as being in space and time. That statement is in the third volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 447. This is an important but very difficult concept for us who are so used to thinking in terms of three-dimensional space and sequential time to grasp. But the quotation goes on to say, as the former, that is the planes of cosmos, are seven in one, so are we seven in one. And that same absolute soul of the world, which is both matter and non-matter, spirit and non-spirit, being a non-being. Impress yourselves with, well with this idea, all those of you who would study the mysteries of self. Before we conclude this cassette, we should perhaps mention the esoteric information on the chakras, which interests so many students and even practitioners of occultism. What we are told will no doubt surprise many. Our seven chakras are all situated in the head and it is these master chakras which govern and rule the seven, for there are seven, principal plexuses in the body besides the 42 minor ones to which physiology refuses that name. That quotation is from the third volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 507. 
We are told we can call these plexus centers chakras or padmas or wheels, the lotus heart and petals, if we will. We are further told that when the time comes, advanced students will be given minute details about the master chakras and taught the use of them. Till then, less difficult subjects have to be learned. If asked whether the seven plexuses or tattvic centers of action are the centers where the seven rays of the Logos vibrate, the answer is in the affirmative, with the additional simple remark that the rays of the Logos vibrate in every atom. That is the end of this side of this cassette.